Hey y'all, I'm Lauren and welcome to Cantina Cast. Today I am talking about Defy the Storm written by Tessa Grattan and Justina Ireland. This is the first young adult novel release of Phase 3 of The High Republic and this novel comes out on March 5th. This novel primarily follows Avon Staros, Xylan Graf, Jordana Sparkburn, and Silvestri Yarrow. And also, Vernestra Rowe is in here as well, and there is a question in this book about what has become of Emery since he went missing at the fall of Starlight Beacon, and so that question is explored in this novel as well. This novel did feel a little bit different from the other stuff that's already come out with Phase 3 because it's, ex it's following different characters than the ones that we've already been following for Phase 3. If you've been keeping up with Phase 3, I mean, we're more used to seeing some of those um, kind of more, I guess, experienced Jedi characters that we got to know so well in Phase 1, like Elzar Man, Avar Chris, all of the, that whole gang. But with this book, we're following different characters. So we're actually following the characters from Out of the Shadows from Phase 1. So in that way, it was kind of hard for me to know 100% for sure if this book is one of those ones that you're going to have to read in terms of where it falls with the rest of the Phase 3 storyline. Um, for a lot of this book, it did feel like we were kind of following sort of a different story from the one that we've already been following with Phase 3. While, of course, it is the High Republic, so these characters and the things that are happening to them is the type of issues that we've been seeing in the High Republic. Like, of course, it's issues with the Stormwall, which we're familiar with, issues with the Nihil versus the Jedi, all of that kind of stuff. But because it was different characters, there was a time when I was reading this and I was like, is this going to be need-to-know information like for the person that might not have time to get to everything? Um, so that was kind of a question I was asking myself. Now, that might be revealed to us later on, like that I might... As more books come out, I might have a more concrete answer in terms of is, if this one is something that you absolutely have to know this story to be able to follow the rest of the High Republic. But at this time, I wasn't really, I didn't really arrive to a conclusion one way or the other. Now, I will say if you're a completionist in terms of wanting to have all of the High Republic books or wanting to read all of the High Republic books, then this one is going to be one that you're going to want to read, of course. A lot of times, the stuff that we do see in the YA books, it does come up later on. Like, this stuff will be mentioned again. Um, we will see these characters again. So, if you're wanting to know everything that happens to all of the characters of the High Republic, then, of course, you'll want to read this one. But if you're one of those readers who you kind of need to be a little bit more selective about which High Republic books you get to then with this one, it's kind of hard to say 100% one way or the other. I will say that if you're interested in Vernestra Rowe, particularly because she is going to make an appearance in The Acolyte that has been confirmed, this book does follow some of Vernestra's growth as a Jedi. So for me, that would be like the main selling point of this book is if you want to find out about what's going on with Vernestra, if you want some more background on her character, then that is explained a little bit in this book. As well, we also do find out what's going on with Emery. That was something that um, a lot of the other characters in the High Republic have been uncertain of his whereabouts after the fall of Starlight Beacon. And so in this book, we actually do get that addressed. So that would be another main selling point of this book is if you want to know what's going on with Emery, that does come up in this book as well. Those are my general thoughts about the book, kind of what you can expect if you're considering reading this one. And now I am going to start talking spoilers. So if you haven't read it yet and you don't want spoilers, now is your time to turn back. So this book opens with Avon Staros. She is with her mother, Gira Staros, on Hetzal. And one thing that I found very satisfying about this introduction is that everything that I've been complaining about, about Gira, like, I mean, this character has been driving me crazy because I don't know what she wants. I know it's explained a couple of times, but like, to me, I'm just, I'm not really buying it yet. And Avon feels the exact same way. So I did find that satisfying that somebody said it. 
And the person that probably knows Gira the most said it. So I very much appreciated that. So Avon is stuck on Hetzal with her mother, Gira, and she is sick and tired of it. A lot of the Nihil keep trying to kill her. It's very dangerous. Avon is like, what are we doing here? This place is horrible. And during this time, Avon finds out from her Nihil bodyguard, Diva, who... Diva is a Nihil technically, but she's not really a Nihil at heart. Like, she joined the Nihil a while back because she felt like she had no choice. But since then, she doesn't agree with the Nihil ways, but it's not like she can just leave whenever she wants. So, Diva and Avon uh, kind of have developed a friendship over time, and they both have a lot of trust in each other. So, Diva technically is Avon's Nihil bodyguard, but she's really more than that. They really have a close friendship. And Diva tells Avon that Emery's hiding out on this planet called Aricho, and there is a concern about General Vice setting her sights on that planet soon and going there and destroying everything. So it's kind of like a situation where if you want to get Emery out, now is the time to do so. And the final straw for Avon is that there is another attempt on Avon's life where another Nihil tries to kill her. So, and then Diva has to take care of this guy. And so all of that together has just made Avon be like, you know what? I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going out of here. I don't care what my mother says. And she makes a pretty big statement when she does this. She takes this guy's decapitated head, throws it on the dinner table during this Nihil dinner banquet thing. And is like, I'm going to school on Coruscant now and you can't stop me and then just leave. So then Avon is going to university on Coruscant and there is a time when she sneaks into the Jedi archives during like a school field trip type of situation and she sneaks into the Jedi archives and she's trying to look up information about where Vernestra is and Reith Silas makes a brief appearance he catches her snooping around and he tells her where Vernestra is. And Vernestra is in hiding. She's living on a rural middle of nowhere planet where no one suspects that she is, um, that she doesn't want to know at least. And she's trying to get in touch with the Force, trying to deal with the death of Stellan, which has really affected her. And um, she's really feeling kind of lost at the moment, but she feels like by being in this quiet place and focusing on her meditation and the force and all of that, she feels like that is helping her. And Avon shows up thanks to Wreath's information and she tells Vernestra that Emery is alive. And Vernestra is just overcome with such a huge feeling of relief. She's sobbing. She's just absolutely beside herself because of what this means to her because Emery was her Padawan. So the thought that he had died on Starlight Beacon was another thing that had really been weighing on her. So it's a huge relief to find out that he's alive. And Avon convinces Vernestra to come with her and they are going to go find Emery and bring him back together. And Avon is pretty selective about the information that she wants to tell Vernestra at this point. Because even though Avon loves Vernestra, she knows that Vernestra is a Jedi and she's always afraid that Vernestra is not going to approve of her plan or her methods. And Avon's perspective is kind of like, yeah, well, sometimes, you know, to get something done, you have to sometimes do take a route that might be a little bit messy. And she feels like Vernestra isn't really going to get that. So she's kind of not telling Vernestra her whole plan yet. But at this point, she's just happy that she has Vernestra convinced to come along. And while they're on the ship, which, by the way, the ship that they're on is the vessel. So we do get a fun little appearance of Affy and Leox and Geode, which is great. Um, I loved those characters from Phase 1. So I'm hoping we get to spend some more time with them in Phase 3 because in this book, they make a pretty brief appearance. But while they're in hyperspace on this ship, Vernestra does start having her hyperspace visions again but this time they actually are getting stronger she's having the ones that she has in this book are happening when she's awake and she sees a vision of marie santeca who is no longer living at this point and she's just telling her to make it right so it's a pretty unsettling vision and vernestra doesn't really know exactly what to think of it yet in this book we are also following jordana sparkburn and sylvester yarrow these characters were also from Out of the Shadows from Phase 1. For work right now, they're doing runs for Maz Kanata, and they're pretty satisfied with their job because it's pretty low risk. It pays well. It's easy. They feel like they've, they've got good work right now. They both are kind of conflicted because they both have a lot of questions left over about what's happened to their families. Silvestri's mother, Chansey Yarrow, betrayed her back in Out of the Shadows, and... 
Jordana's family. So Jordana is related to the Santecas and she doesn't really know what's become of them lately because she's been separated from them for so long. So Jordana wants to help her family that is stuck behind the storm wall and Silvestri wants to know what became of her mother if she's even alive or dead. We as the reader know what became of her because Elzar Man killed her on Starlight Beacon back in phase one but nobody else knows that. That's a secret right now. Also in this book we're following Xylan Graf. Xylan Graf is one of those characters that I'm not gonna lie he drives me a little bit crazy because I feel like I can never tell what his actual motivations are. They feel like they change depending on the situation. So if you're the type of reader that enjoys a morally gray character like that then you might connect with this character more than I have. For me, I just, I like it when I know what is driving a character. Whether I agree with it or not is a different story, but I like to know what that motivation is. And I, I like for it to be something that's consistent for the character. With Xylan, you just don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what's going to drive that decision. You don't know if it's money. You don't know if he actually cares about people. You just don't know. So He's always having me scratching my head because sometimes I just don't know what to think of him. But at the start of this book, he is being held hostage by the Nihil because he is actually working on the storm wall for them. And the storm seeds were developed based on graph tech. So he is one of the only people that is actually able to do this. But the Nihil are not very happy with him at the moment because, of course, Avar Chris just recently was able to escape through the storm wall. So Xylan Graf is trying to reassure everybody that this is not repeatable. What she did was like a crazy one in a million scenario, but they're still all pretty angry. He does get permission to go through the storm wall to Hosnian Prime to meet with Gira to discuss like resources for his work on the storm wall. And also what he wants to do deep down is he's trying to form a sort of alliance with Gira. So he gets the permission to go to Hosnian Prime. And so he goes to this party type, type of thing that Gira is having. Now, the reason that Gira is on Hosnian Prime is because she's, it, the way that this book explains it is it sounds like she's kind of developed a sort of alliance with Hosnian Prime. Like they kind of are like slapping her on the wrist because Hosnian Prime is not in the occlusion zone. Um, so there, Hosnian Prime isn't thrilled with, what she's done but they are willing to let her be on Hosnian Prime I don't know I am honestly a little bit unclear as to why Hosnian Prime isn't like making her face any kind of consequences um it sounds like Hosnian Prime felt like there was maybe something in it for them to ally with her like maybe the Nihil wouldn't beat up on them so hard if they treated Gira nice that was pretty much the best explanation that I could come up with but I don't know it seems pretty pretty bad for Hosnian Prime's government to not take a stand on this so but I mean that's what's happening at this point I guess so anyway there's this party on Hosnian Prime Xylan goes and while he's there he does talk to Gira he tells her that he wants to be an informant for her him and Gira openly hate each other, but, but I, I mean, I guess they both also understand that they need the resources that the other person has to offer. So it sounds like there might be a sort of alliance between the two of them going forward. But during this party, Jordana and Silvestri show up in disguise and they kidnap Xylan Graf because he has a bounty on his head. And these three people know each other from uh, Out of the Shadows. So once Xylan realizes who they are, he does actually apologize to Silvestri for betraying her back in phase one. And it does seem like Xylan does care about Silvestri as a friend, even though his actions don't really say that. But the fact that he went out of his way to apologize made me think that maybe he does care because Xylan Graf does not seem like the type of person that would apologize if he didn't actually want to. And Jordana and Silvestri are debating about if they want to actually turn over Xylan to the client or not because they are kind of worried about what's going to become of him if they do. So even though he drives them crazy too, they, you know, they're not heartless. They don't want anything really bad to happen to him. But it turns out that the client is Diva, who actually, the real client is Avon. So Avon and Vernestra and Diva, they all go out to space where the goddess is and um, they go to pick Xylan up. And this is when the truth comes out to Vernestra about Avon putting the bounty on Xylan. And Avon explains to Vernestra that 
Xylan is their way to understanding the storm wall because what Avon wants to do is she really wants to destroy the storm wall and get that figured out. And she feels like Xylan is part of the key for doing that. So when Xylan is about to go with Avon and Vernestra, Jordana agrees to actually go with Xylan. Xylan wanted Jordana to come because he wants some insurance that something bad isn't going to happen to him. Like he has a buddy with him. And the reason that Jordana agrees is because she really wants to know what has become of her family. So she's going with him to kind of get her own information. And the deal that they have is that if she comes with him, then Xylan will hook her up with one of his Santeca contacts. And the Grafts and the Santecas are supposed to be enemies. So it is kind of surprising that Xylan has a secret Santeca contact. So they all go to the planet Sesuena, which is where is this planet is pretty much where a lot of stuff is going to be happening. So this is where the Santeca contact is. And um, Avon agrees to drop off Xylan and Jordana to go meet up with the Santeca contact before they all move on to the next part of their mission. So while they're on this one of their, everybody kind of goes off and does their own thing. So Xylan and Jordana, they go off to meet the contact. And then Avon and Vernestra, at one point, they're walking around in town on Sesuena, and there is an issue where a nameless shows up, not for Vernestra, but is just kind of walking around. And that ends up leading to a really close call because, of course, Vernestra is like beside herself when the Nameless is nearby and it takes her a while to recover from this. And then after Avon drops off Vernestra to recover from the encounter with the Nameless, that is when Avon kidnaps Xylan again and she demands that he take her to the lightning crash, which is the Nihil station that controls the storm wall. And then meanwhile, at the same time, Jordana talks with Care, who is the Santeca contact. We find out that Xylan and Care, they actually are in a relationship together. Later on in the book, we find out that they're actually secretly married. Um... But so that's why Xylan has a Santeca contact that it's surprising that he has is because that's actually his husband. And Kara agrees to take Jordana to the planet Arlie's moon, which is where Jordana is from originally. And that's where her brother and his family still are. So Kara agrees to take her. He's like, your family, let's just, we'll go together. And he's very willing to help her out. Meanwhile, when Xylan and Avon get to the lightning crash, Avon originally says that she wants to just blow up the whole station, but Xylan says, no, first of all, my dog Plinka is on the station, and second of all, don't kill everyone on the station. So um, that part was kind of funny because um, Plinka is a super cute dog character, so I thought that was fun um, that Xylan was like, no, the only reason I don't want you to blow it up is because of my dog. <laughs> While they're on the station, Xylan actually is able to contact Nan, who is another Nihil who she actually witnessed what happened to Chansey Yarrow on Starlight. And Nan was just one of the people who survived Starlight. So Nan tells Xylan what happened to Chansey Yarrow. And this is something that is going to come up later again in the book. But at the time, Avon doesn't know that Xylan is getting this information, which he is getting for Sylvestri. And after this, Xylan gets his dog Plinka. So Plinka is okay. Don't worry. And... Avon has a standoff with Dr. M. Kampa, who was previously Avon's professor. And they're enemies now because Dr. M. Kampa stole Avon's work with her crystal array, which ended up contributing to the storm wall. So Avon's got a big grudge. And when Avon runs into this professor, she wants to kill her. And um, she's actually getting ready to do it. But Xylan ends up walking in at the last moment and stops her from doing that but he does wound the professor so that way they're able to get away and when they're there avon does destroy the crystal array which is one of the things that's partially powering the storm wall so when she does that it does cause an issue but she's also fully aware that it's not bringing the storm wall down permanently it's just kind of creating a complication for the nihil and at the same time jordana and care they do get to arlie's moon but when they're coming in, even from a distance, they can see that the moon looks like something is really wrong with it. Um, it's actually started to crumble into dust. But surprisingly, there are still people who live on the moon. 
And Jordana's brother is one of them. And so is his wife and child. And there's a lot of back and forth at this point about why don't they leave. And sometimes they're like, we don't leave because this is our home. And then sometimes they're like, we don't leave because the night he'll stop us. So I guess it's kind of like a combination of reasons, but it felt like they're, every time they were asked, why don't you leave? It felt like their answer would kind of change. But long story short, these people are living on the moon and they're not leaving the moon for various reasons. And so what's going on with this planet is it is crumbling and it's they they don't really know what it is. They don't know if it's a disease or if it's a fungus or if it's a what, because it destroys things and it also destroys people like if somebody touches it, then the person eventually will crumble into dust too. So pretty much the way this is being described, you can tell it must have something to do with the nameless because it's the same process of destruction that the nameless does. It's just a lot slower than the nameless. Instead of it being instant, it takes place over the course of hours. And so Jordana's like, okay, take me to the edge of where this stuff is because I want to get a closer look at it. And when they go do that, um, her and Care are looking off into the distance at this destruction. And there's a sinkhole. They almost fall in, but they just barely don't fall in. And then they're like, okay, that was really bad. I guess this whole moon is going to collapse now. So we need to get everybody out of here, whether you want to or not. And so Jordana and Care take everybody that they can onto their ship with them. But once they get on the ship, they see that care somehow has um, some of that stuff, the crumbling stuff on him. So he's going to die in a few hours. And so they basically a Hail Mary that they do is Jordana cuts his hand off and they're like, okay, hopefully this will stop it from spreading. We don't know if it's actually going to, but maybe it will. Turns out it does stop it from spreading. Thankfully care survives and Jordana takes his, cut off hand with her um, because she's going to give it to the Republic for them to study. Thank God they all make it off of the moon safely. Jordana drops off her brother and her, his family on Siswena. She drops off Care on Siswena as well. He's going to be okay. And her and Care are actually going to, they make an agreement that they're going to continue to work together to try to get people out of the occlusion zone. And when she's dropping off care, Xylan is there too because him and Avon had come back to Siswena as well because that's pretty much where they're all going to meet up before they try to get back through the storm wall to the other side again. When Jordana sees Xylan again, he gives her the data stick that has Nan's explanation of what happened to Chansey on it. So Jordana is going to watch it and she's going to tell Sylvester what is on there. And Xylan doesn't go back with them. He stays on Siswena with care. During this time, what Vernestra is doing is she goes to Aricho to find Emery. And what she finds when she gets to Aricho is that Emery is completely taking care of himself. He's totally fine. He's actually leading a resistance against the Nihil which seems to be coordinated pretty well. Like he's doing pretty good at it. And when Vernestra first gets there, they're doing a mission that had already been planned before she got there. And she actually almost messes the mission up. So it's kind of like, I'm, I mean, honestly, it kind of feels like Emery has kind of outgrown Vernestra. Like I almost feels like he kind of passed her up. Some people might debate me on that, but that was kind of the vibe that I got just because he seems like very sure of himself He seems like he's really made a place for himself on this planet and he knows what he's meant to be doing. And it's to the point that Vernestra actually knights Emery when she is with him because she's like, you're not a Padawan anymore. Like, you're good. And she offers for him to come back with her and he refuses because he feels like he's doing what he's supposed to be doing on a Richo. So he's going to keep that up. Something else that was interesting too is that Vernestra... So she had his kyber crystal because Avon had been hanging on to it for him. And Vernestra tries to give it back to her and he actually refuses. And he says that he doesn't want to fight. So I thought that was interesting because of course he's still a Jedi. He's a knight now, but he doesn't want to use a lightsaber or fight. So it'll be interesting to see exactly what that's going to look like for this character going forward. But when Vernestra and Diva leave Aricho to go back to Siswena, They find that the Nihil has scrambled all the path codes um, because of what Avon pulled on the lightning crash. So they have a really hard time getting back to Siswena safely because of all of the scav droids that are after them now. 
Basically, even though Diva has a Nihil ship, the scav droids no longer recognize it as such because of the scrambling of the path codes that happen. So once Bernestra and Diva get back to Siswena and they meet up with Avon and Jordana, they all have to figure out how the heck they're going to get off this planet now. So Avon examines the path engine. She's going to try to figure it out. She's going to try to crack the code to be able to get out safely. Um, but her calculations aren't really foolproof, so she keeps having to go back to the drawing board. And during all of this, it's Avon working the computer, and then you have Jordana, who is in a spacesuit on the outside of the ship, literally fighting, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat, fighting scav droids. And then you also have Vernestra inside the ship, and she's using the Force to try to navigate through hyperspace. It's crazy. Like, it's, it's, it's all hands on deck. And um, it's everybody scrambling, just throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what sticks. And surprisingly, actually, all of that does work and they are able to get through the storm wall. And Jordana and Silvestri are reunited. And of course, that's a big deal because Silvestri was afraid that she would never see Jordana again. And Jordana does tell Silvestri what happened to Chansey because Jordana watched the recording that was on the data stick. And so she tells Jordana that Elzar Man killed Chansey Yarrow on Starlight Beacon, even though Chansey Yarrow was trying to save the station. So the truth is out now about what Elzar did. And Jordana also tells Vernestra and gives Vernestra a copy of the data stick too. Something else interesting that happens with Vernestra too is that Marie in a vision gave her some coordinates and Vernestra doesn't know what the coordinates lead to, but she asks Diva about it and Diva tells her that they lead to a bad place that defies reality and she was like i don't think you should go there like you should get rid of these coordinates basically and so i'm wondering if if diva's talking about planet x i don't know for sure we don't find out in this book what exactly she's talking about but i feel like this is going to come up in later books it's very briefly mentioned in this book i mean maybe a paragraph but it felt kind of like a breadcrumb that we might get later on. So I just wanted to mention it for that reason, because who knows if, what this is and if it's going to come up again. Also through this whole situation, Avon has learned a lot about how to get through the storm wall. And so she knows that what you can do to get through the storm wall is you need a path engine, you need a bunch of path codes, and you need a force user who's able to use the force to navigate through hyperspace. If you have those three, and you just try really hard, then you can probably get through the storm wall. It's not a great system, but that's pretty much the only thing that Avon can recreate at this present time. But Avon also is, when she goes back to Coruscant, she joins a research team for trying to figure out how to get past the storm wall. So she has her method that they did together when they were scrambling and just trying to desperately figure out something that's an option but she's also looking for a more permanent solution to the storm wall with a research team and avon does apologize to vernestra about having her get involved with this plan and then being deceitful about what all the plan entailed and vernestra is really understanding about it and she's just like sometimes she she seems like she finally understands the concept of sometimes like you have to do things like that for the greater good and I'm glad that Vernestra finally understands that because there were moments in this book where she was driving me crazy. Like she just really had no concept at the beginning of this book of sometimes you got to lay low. Like sometimes you got to not draw a bunch of attention to yourself just to like be successful with what you're doing. Like if she would see someone in trouble, she would completely blow her cover to try to go help that person, even though it really wasn't in everybody's best interest to go about things like that. And it was driving me crazy. So I'm really glad that Vernestra seems to finally understand this concept because I felt like it was getting in the way of her being a good Jedi. And Vernestra does take this to the council. She shows up and she explains where she was. She explains that the reason that she left without giving notice is because she was trying to um, find the force again, kind of come to terms with everything that had been lost and that she was just 
she was feeling lost at the moment. And so Yoda accepts that. And so since Yoda accepts it, of course, pretty much the rest of the council does. And so that meeting goes successfully. But then what she does after that is she has a meeting with Elzar where she confronts Elzar about what she learned about how he killed Chance Yaro. And she tells him, you have to tell the council. And I don't think she explicitly said this, but to me it was implied. Like, either you tell them or I will. So she's giving him a chance to do the right thing. So it'll be interesting to see what Elzar does because, um, yeah, I mean, knowing Elzar, I don't think he's going to do the right thing, but who knows? He might surprise me. And then we have the epilogue of this book, which was really interesting because we see Reef again in the epilogue. And we also see Aslan Rell in the epilogue too, who... For me, that is one of the most enigmatic characters of the High Republic so far. And I really want to know more about this character. I feel like we are learning little bits and pieces of him as more stories are coming out. But it's just, I really want to know what's going on with him. So I was glad that he was included in this epilogue. And I was surprised because I totally wasn't expecting it. And we don't really find out anything super concrete about Aslan in the epilogue, but we do know that this is taking place after he destroyed Travix Prime. So he is still, the Jedi are still working with him because they need him and they need his knowledge about the Nameless. But he's pretty much, he's not, in, he's not a prisoner, but like he can't really leave his room um, because they don't trust him now. So he is still there. Reef is working with him, but Aslan can't really come and go as he pleases. And Reef is totally creeped out by Aslan, but he's trying to be nice. He's trying to not show that he's creeped out by Aslan, but Aslan's behavior, it's just hard to not be creeped out by. And Reef actually tells Aslan about the hand from care santeca's hand that jordana brought back so it sounds like they're going to do some research on that aslan's response to this is interesting because it seems like when wreath describes to aslan what is going on on that planet it seems like it kind of rings a bell for aslan but we don't know exactly if that sounds familiar to him like if he knows what it is we really don't know because aslan is like a very cryptic character who speaks in riddles so i don't know if aslan knows exactly what that is but it does sound like it has something to do with the nameless so they're gonna have to figure that out because that could be pretty catastrophic if um the nameless is able to destroy like a whole planet something else too that aslan says to wreath this is really the most striking thing for me from the epilogue is that Aslan kind of gives Reef a hint about when it comes to dealing with the nameless, you have to understand what you're afraid of and make friends with it. And that had me thinking about other Jedi that I've seen in the High Republic who seem like they're able to handle the nameless better than others. Like some Jedi seem like they're able to kind of keep their heads on in the presence of the nameless and then some Jedi just completely come apart and I wonder if that has something to do with it. Like maybe, this is just me theorizing, but maybe those Jedi who have done more of that work about making friends with you're afraid of and kind of having more of an understanding of that, I wonder if those ones, those are the ones that are going to be able to handle the nameless more versus those that haven't worked through that type of an issue before. So I don't know. I found that line very compelling though, because I feel like it it does kind of suggest maybe there's a psychological component to being more prepared and more able to handle the nameless. And it's not just about like figuring out what its weakness is, but maybe there's things that the Jedi can do for themselves to make themselves more resistant to it. I don't know. I think that that is probably going to be explained more, but I'm interested to see where that goes. And that was the end of the story. So it definitely ended on a very interesting note that had me wanting to find out more about where exactly that's going, especially leaving off with Aslan like that. But let me know if this book prompted any theories like that for you, if it kind of suggested anything to you that you feel like might be a clue for where this may be going or just kind of what you're hoping to see next for these characters. And thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope that y'all have a great rest of your day. Bye, y'all.